The second thing to be aware of is something that psychologists have called in-group bias. In-group bias. In-group bias basically means, and again, we're all guilty of it. These are things, there's nothing wrong with it. It's human beings do this. In-group bias, as the term applies, implies, of, uh, pr refers to the fact that you are always biased towards your own group. And you make excuses for your own group. And you look positively at your own group versus those who are outside of it. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. It is human nature that what your group does, if the same thing were to be done by somebody outside, you would problematize it. But when it's done by your side, your people, your group, in your minds, you find a justification. Right? Now, why is this important? Because we are the other when it comes to this society. And things that our religion has done or the Prophet has done or has happened in the Sahaba's time, this is not in-group bias. We have in-group bias when we look at those things. We find an easy justification. From our paradigm, it makes sense. But realize, if the same things had happened against us, we would have not found justification for those things. And there's nothing wrong with this. It's human nature. In group bias, you do it. And the point is that whoever you identify with, you will always look at in a more sympathetic light. And whoever you think of as the other, as outside of you, you don't identify it. You will dismiss, you will criticize, you will exaggerate. And I think the most obvious example for this in our times is the issue of terrorism and the tactics of terrorism and the counter tactics of terrorism. This whole debate for the last 15 years, we as the Muslim community have been put in such an awkward position because outsiders don't understand what is going on in our side of the world. We don't agree with the tactics of those terrorists, but we understand why what they're doing, they're doing it. But the people outside don't even understand that. And when they do even worse to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Syria, they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. This is called in-group bias. When they do Guantanamo, when they do invasion, when they do if this and that, for them, oh, but they did 9-11. Oh, but they, everything is justified. This is in-group bias. You make a million excuses for your own, right? And everything that your group does, it just falls into place naturally. Oh, but that's, we couldn't help it. It's self-defense. Those guided missiles, those drones. I mean, what do you expect us to do? Oh, but if they do a drone on us, or if they do more than this, oh, ha, that's terrorism. You know, that's, you know the, the, the classic issue of defining terrorism. And I've, I have a whole class I teach, uh, used to teach at Rhodes about terrorism and, and whatnot. And we go into academic detail. Uh, and again, let's forget uh, Muslim terrorism because it gets very awkward <laughs> speaking about that. Let's talk about something everybody else should be aware of, the IRA in the 80s and 90s versus the United Kingdom. The IRA. The Irish Republican Army, right? The Irish Re Re Republican Army was uh, a group that is deemed terrorist by the British government. In the 80s and 90s, in the 70s actually, it declared war against the United Kingdom. And their list of grievances went pages and pages and pages, dating back to 1550. No exaggeration. The Irish and the British did not get along, if you don't know, for a long period of time. Colonialism and plundering and raping and pillaging. So there's a long list of grievances that the IRA have. And in after World War II, the IRA say, enough is enough. We're going to fight for our freedom. And anyone who's above the age of 35, you guys probably have no clue, there were bombs being set off in London year after year. Anytime there was a bomb... Muslims didn't even bat an eyelid. We know we're not guilty for those bombs. Everybody knew who's doing the bombs in London, who's doing the bombs in across England, who's doing it? IRA. Now you ask the IRA, and they're like, this is justified because of all that they have done. The irony here in America, the IRA was a legitimate organization. Some of our main congressmen and senators now were actually members of the IRA. 
and they would raise funds for the IRA. And this is well known, and they don't even deny it, because from their perspective, this is legitimate resistance. And when the IRA was asked about these terrorism tactics, they would always, on you know, blatant uh, um, you know, television, they would justify, say, hey, you're doing much worse to us. This is a war of independence that we are fighting against you guys. And um, when I took a class with Tony Blair, if you remember my article that I wrote, I actually brought this up with Tony Blair directly, the double standards of the IRA and the quote-unquote you know, Muslim terrorists or Islamic terrorists out there. The point being, if we can understand one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, the simple adage, if we can understand this and we see it constantly, we need to understand whether we like it or not. Some of the tactics that we know in our textbooks, we're looking at it from one side of the aisle, and the other guys are looking at it from the other side of the aisle. You're not going to be able to justify or contextualize. It really depends on who do you sympathize with. What side do you consider yourself to be a part of? If you're Irish, even if you don't agree with the tactics of the IRA, overall you're more sympathetic to them than you are to the other side. Because you know what they've done to your people, right? And so even if you say, oh, they shouldn't have put a bomb in central London, but... And then you go on with that but, right? Whereas the other side, they're not looking at those grievances. And they're like, oh, these people were killed. And you cannot bring the British and the Irish to fully agree on those tactics that happened in the 70s, 80s, and, and early 90s, right? It's not going to happen. If you can't get two people of the same skin color and the same Christian religion to understand, do you really think you're going to get a brown-skinned Muslim from the Middle East or Pakistan and somebody from, to really understand the tactics of 1,400 years ago. We have to be pragmatic and realistic and stop telling ourselves fairy tales. You cannot be taught a two-minute response that will sol solidly refute some of the issues of our seerah against those who criticize it. If you can't even have a Westerner understand the IRA, do you think they're going to understand something 1,500 years ago in a different place and time, and in particular, different religion and different system altogether? And again, all of this needs to be done because such is life. This is politics. That's war. Just like the IRA has its views and whatnot, and the other side has its views, that's what happens when you're fighting a battle. And in the end of the day, like I said, it really does depend on which side you're looking at and where your sympathies and loyalties lie. Our own country, the United States of America, it justifies everything that it does in the name of tactics. It justifies everything as morally correct. And we all feel very ambivalent about that because we know it's not correct. What do you think most of our people here feel? <laughs> إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا 